Welcome to part one of the Design the New Normal cycling webinar series. This webinar is designed for people who are thinking about getting into cycling. We'll cover the things that you should know when buying a bike, how to find a bike that fits you properly, legal requirements that you should know about when riding, clothing and gear that you might need, and how to check your bike over before you ride. Cycling is a great activity that can be used for fun, for exercise, or for getting around town. There are a lot of reasons why people decide to take up cycling. Often it's for convenience. When you're on a bike, it's easy to take, make multiple stops without looking for parking or waiting for the next bus. Cycling is also reliable because you're less affected by congestion than you are in a car. Related to that, people who ride bikes often talk about the freedom that comes from cycling. You aren't constrained by congestion or by having to find parking. You're under your own power and you can even transition to transit if you get tired or if the weather turns bad. Cycling is fun, it's good exercise, it saves you money if you replace car or transit trips, and these days it also offers a good social distancing alternative to public transit. I'm going to start today by talking about the different parts of the bicycle. When you are thinking about buying a bike, it's really good to know some of the terminology so that you understand what bike shops or online sellers are talking about. The frame is the skeleton of the bike and consists of everything labeled here. Each tube on the frame has a name, as you can see in the diagram above, but the only three that I want to point out to you today are the top tube, which is the tube that goes straight across the top of the bike, the head tube, which is that little tube right at the front of the bike, and the down tube that angles downwards from the head tube. What most people think of as the seat of a bike is technically called the saddle. That being said, it's okay to keep calling it a seat, and a lot of people do. The saddle sits on top of the seat post, which can be adjusted up and down to change the height of the saddle to fit you properly. Everyone's probably familiar with the handlebars that you use to steer the bike. On the handlebars, you'll find brake levers that connect to your brakes and allow you to stop the bike, and possibly also shift levers to change gears. The handlebars are connected to your frame by the stem, which, like the seat post, can be adjusted to make your bike more comfortable. We all know what a wheel is, but people often don't know the difference between the wheels and the tires of a bike. The wheel is basically the entire metal structure, including the spokes, the rim, and the hub at the center of the wheel. The tire is the rubber part that sits on the outside of the wheel, and inside the tire, there's a rubber tube that holds air when we inflate our tires. The drivetrain is a collection of parts that allows your pedaling to move the bicycle. There are a couple of parts that I'd like to point out for you. The chain ring is the big set of gears near the middle of the bike. All bikes have between one to three chain rings. At the back of the bike, there's also a group of gears called the freewheel or the cassette, Bikes can have anywhere from 1 to 11 gears at the back. Having a range of gears gives you the option of making pedaling easier when you're going up a hill, or making pedaling harder, which also allows you to go faster. The more chain rings you have on the front, and the more gears you have on the back, the more options you'll have for adjusting your gears to match your preferred speed and level of effort. The chain rings at the front and the gears at the back are connected by the chain. When you pedal, the crank arms turn the chain ring, which moves the chain that in turn moves the gears. Because the gears are attached to the rear wheel, this makes it turn and drives your bike forward. The last labeled item here is the derailers, which allow you to change gears. The derailers literally derail your chain, moving it from one gear or one chain ring to another. When you're choosing what type of bicycle to get, you're going to want to consider a few factors. There are many different types of bikes that are designed for different purposes, so you need to think about what you plan to use the bike for. You're going to want a very different bike if you just want to use it to run errands than you will if you want to hit the mountain bike trails on the weekend. Once you have an idea of what type of bike you need, you'll also need to find one that fits you properly, and you'll also probably be thinking about the price. Road bikes are the bikes that people usually think of when they think of your classic bicycle. Road bikes are designed to be ridden at relatively fast speeds on paved roads. 
They usually have drop bars, which are the curved handlebars that you can see in the photo here. They usually have two chain rings on the front and anywhere from 5 to 11 gears at the back, allowing you to adjust as the road goes uphill and downhill. Road bikes have narrow, hard tires that reduce resistance on the road and help you to go faster, but they also let you feel every bump in the road. Road bikes also put the rider into a bent over posture, which is very efficient for going fast, but not very comfortable. If you want to ride fast and far on paved roads only, a road bike is a great choice for you. Mountain bikes are designed to be ridden on all sorts of terrain. They usually have straight handlebars that give you a comfortable, stable grip. They almost always have three chain rings on the front and anywhere from seven to 11 gears at the back, giving you a huge range of gear options to tackle the steep uphills and downhills that you might encounter off-road. Mountain bikes have fat, bumpy tires that help you to remain stable on different surfaces and often also have suspension systems to absorb bumps and vibrations. While this makes mountain bikes much more comfortable than road bikes, the trade-off is that mountain bikes tend to be heavier than road bikes, and they'll be slower when you're biking on the road. Mountain biking is a really fun hobby and great exercise, but unless you're planning to spend most of your time riding off-road, a mountain bike is probably not going to be your ideal bike. Hybrid bikes sit somewhere between a road bike and a mountain bike. They can have drop bars or straight bars and usually have a decent number of gears, medium width tires, and a comfortable body position. A hybrid is a fantastic choice for a casual cyclist. They allow you to ride comfortably and easily on pavement and recreational trails. If you're looking for something for just fun casual rides, this is probably the bike for you. City or commuter bikes, sometimes also called Dutch bikes, are comfortable bikes that are made for riding around the city. The bikes allow you to sit in a very comfortable upright position, which also makes it easy to see around you in traffic. These bikes are built to be sturdy and low maintenance. They usually have attachment points for a basket or a rack to carry things around with you too. This type of bike is great for someone who wants a sturdy, comfortable bike to use for getting around town and running errands. I've covered the top four types of bicycle that you'll usually see, but there are tons of other types of bike out there. There are bikes designed for long distance touring, cargo bikes that can carry more than 100 pounds, long tail bikes for riding with children, and even tandem bikes that allow two people to ride together. There are also e-bikes that feature an electric motor to give you a boost when you're going up hills or carrying a lot of weight. If you need your bike to serve a really specific purpose, you can pretty much always find a bike that's built just for that purpose. If you are wondering about men's versus women's bikes, for the most part, it isn't important. There are some manufacturers who offer women's models that are supposedly built to better match women's proportions, but the proportions that they use are just averages and those bikes tend to have mixed reviews. What it really comes down to is your own body proportions. For example, a woman with long arms might prefer a bike with a longer top tube, whereas a man with shorter arms might be looking for a model with a more compact design. Similarly, while bikes with sloping top tubes are often touted as being for women wearing skirts, that style of frame can be great for anyone who wants an easier way to get on and off of their bike. The people who will most likely benefit from seeking out women-specific bikes are shorter women and men who might benefit from the small sizes that are offered. At the end of the day, the only thing that matters is proper fit, and that's something that depends more on your specific body type than on your gender. So don't be afraid to try bikes that are marketed as men's, women's, or unisex, because any of them might work for you. Before you buy a bike, you need to make certain that it fits you. There are three easy steps that you can do to figure out if a bike fits you correctly. The first and most important thing that we need to do is to determine standover height. Standover height helps us to figure out if the frame is the correct size. This is important because you can change most parts of a bike if you don't like them, but if the frame doesn't work for you, you're really just looking at buying a new bicycle. To check the standover height of a bike, stand straddling the top tube. You should be able to lift the bicycle off the ground about one to two inches. 
If you don't have that much space, then the frame is too big and you're in danger of hurting yourself if you have to stop quickly and step off of the saddle. If you have lots of space, then the frame is too small and the bicycle will probably feel cramped while you're riding it. If your bike has a sloping top tube like the one in this picture, your best bet is to look up the standover height on the manufacturer's website. If you can't do that, just use the highest spot on the top tube as a point of comparison. Once you've determined that the standover height is good, the next step is to check the height of your saddle. Sit on the saddle with your feet on the pedals and move the pedals so that one of your feet is at the very bottom of the pedal rotation. In this position, you should have just a very slight bend in your knee. If your knee is totally straight, then your saddle is too high. If your knee is too bent, then your saddle is too low. So remember, you're looking for just that very slight knee bend for the perfect saddle height. And finally, the last step in determining whether a bike fits you is to take it for a test ride. Different bikes have different geometries, and two bikes that have the same standover height might feel very different to ride. So it's important to make certain that the bike feels comfortable to you while you're riding it. Keep in mind that there are many adjustments that can be made and parts that can be swapped out to make a bike fit you better. So if your bike fits well but has just one thing that's making you uncomfortable, talk to someone at your local bike shop about what you can do to make it better. The last thing I want to talk about on this topic is where to buy a bike for your budget. If you're buying a bike new, it's best to buy from a bike shop when possible. Big box stores tend to have very poor standards when it comes to how the bikes are built, and their cheaper bikes have parts that break easily and are difficult to adjust properly. If you do go with a bike from a big box store, I strongly recommend that you get it tuned up at a bike shop as soon as you get it. Used bikes are a great option if you're looking for something more affordable. You can often find them on sites like Craigslist and Kijiji. Often you can get a better quality used bike for the same price as a cheap brand new bike. The downside to buying a used bike is that you don't know the bike's history all the time and it doesn't come with a warranty. If you're considering buying a used bike, make certain to ask lots of questions. How long have they had the bike? Did they buy it new? Has it been stored inside or has it been sitting out in the elements for years? One very important thing to look for is frame damage. Look for large dents, look for any dents that are near a joint or a weld, um, any cracks, or very large amounts of rust. Any of those would be a problem. You'll also want to look at the top tube and the down tube up near the head tube at the front of the bike. If you see any dents there, any bending in the tube or parallel cracks in the paint like you can see in the photo here, that means that the bike has been in a front end collision and it should not be ridden. Once you're confident that the frame is safe, ask the seller to move the seat post for you. Seat posts can rust in place over time if they're not properly maintained and they can be impossible to get moving again. So you need to make certain that you'll be able to adjust the saddle to a good height for you before you buy the bike. Finally, it's very important to test ride any bike before you buy it, but this is doubly true for used bikes. Not only will you get a sense of whether the bicycle fits you comfortably, it will also help you to identify any mechanical issues that the bike may have. So obviously there are a few things that you need to look for and be careful about when you're buying a used bike, but like I said, often you can get a better quality used bike for the same price as a cheap new bike, so it's definitely a great option if you're looking to buy a bike on a budget. Once you have a bike, there are a few things that you need to make sure your bike has to be in compliance with the law. There are three things that you have to have at all times. Those are a bell, horn, or gong, a rear brake that can skid your wheel on dry level pavement, and white reflective tape on your front fork and red reflective tape on your rear seat stays. If you're riding from half an hour before sunset until half an hour after sunrise, you're also required to have a white front light and a rear red light or reflector. Finally, if you're under 18 years of age, you're legally required to wear a helmet while riding a bicycle. As you can see, the failure to meet any of these requirements can result in a fine. 
It's important to note that the fines listed here will also have a victim fine surcharge and court fee added onto them, bringing most cycling-related fines up to $110. While adults over the age of 18 are not legally required to wear a helmet, it can be a good idea to do so anyway for your own safety. The following video will show you how to wear a helmet properly. A helmet can protect your head in the event of a crash, but it will work best if you wear it properly. Most helmets have a dial at the back that you can use for adjustment. Place the helmet on your head and tighten the dial to make it snug. You should be able to lean over without the helmet falling off. With the helmet strap done up, you should have about two fingers of space between the bottom of the helmet and your eyebrows. Next, make two V's with your fingers and place them under your ears. The helmet strap should match this shape and make a V that ends under your ear. Finally, check that the helmet strap is tight enough. You should only be able to fit one finger between your chin and the strap. Now, you have a properly fit helmet. Unless you're going for a very long ride, you can usually wear your regular clothes while cycling. However, there are a few things to keep in mind. It's always a good idea to dress for the weather, whether that's hot or cold. Bringing a bag with you can be useful to bring an extra layer with you or to carry any layers that you end up taking off. Your shoes should be closed toe and laces should be tied tightly and tucked in. If you're riding in traffic, bright colors and reflective clothing can be helpful for maintaining visibility. And finally, if you have a long skirt or loose pants, make certain that you secure them so that they don't get caught in your chain or your brakes. Some useful equipment to have includes a backpack, rack, or basket for carrying things, water and snacks, especially on hot days, a lock in case you want to leave your bike somewhere, and fenders to protect you against splashes from puddles. While you don't absolutely have to have any of this equipment, it can all be pretty helpful to make your ride nicer and more convenient. It's a good idea to quickly check over your bike before each ride to ensure that your bike is safe to ride and also to catch any mechanical issues before they become big problems. We'll start by checking the front wheel. Squeeze pairs of spokes all the way around the wheel to check for broken spokes. Spin your wheel to make sure that it turns smoothly. Then grab the wheel and try to wiggle it side to side. You shouldn't be able to. If it wiggles even a little bit, we say that the wheel has play and that's something that you should talk to a mechanic about. If your wheel has a quick release lever, Check to make certain that it's closed. A properly adjusted quick release should begin to feel stiff when the lever is sticking straight out from the frame, but you should still be able to press it all the way down to the frame with your hand. Moving on to the tire, check your tire for cracks, holes, or bulges. You can also do a basic pressure check using your hand. The tire should feel firm when you press it with your palm but it should give a little bit if you squeeze it with your fingertips. You should repeat all of these steps with the rear wheel. Next, we'll check the brakes. You'll want to do these steps for both the front and the rear brake. Spin your wheel and watch where the rim goes past your brake pads. There should be a small gap between the pads and the rim on both sides with no contact between the two. Squeeze your brake lever and make sure that your brake springs open again. When you squeeze the brake lever, you should also make certain that you have about two fingers of space between the brake lever and the handlebars. If the brake lever can go all the way down to the bars, that means that you can't put full pressure on the brakes to stop your bike, and that's not safe. You'll also want to check your brake pads for wear. Some pads have a wear line or grooves molded into the rubber. Once you get down to the wear line or those rubber grooves disappear, 
your brake pads need to be replaced. Finally, you need to check your brake cable and housing for cracks or fraying. Next on our list is handlebars. Squeeze the front wheel with your knees to hold it still and make sure that you can't move the handlebars independently of the wheel. This is also a good time to check to make sure that your bell works. The last thing that we'll check is the drivetrain, which includes your cranks and your chain. Like your wheels, you want your cranks to spin smoothly, but there should be no play when you try to wiggle them side to side. You should also check your chain for any stiff or cracked links. The very last step is to do a drop test. Lift the bike a couple of inches off the ground and drop it. If anything rattles or falls off, you'll know that something needs to be adjusted or repaired. By doing this regularly, you'll catch small problems before they become big ones. Because it helps you to catch a lot of mechanical issues, this is also a great thing to do if you're expecting a used bike that you might want to buy. To review, before buying a bike or riding your own bike, it's a good idea to check the wheels and the tires, the handlebars and bell, the brakes, and the drivetrain. So what's next? This webinar is the first of three, so we have two more coming up. Part two covers cycling safety, the rules of the road, basic maintenance, and cycling during the pandemic. Part three covers carrying things, dealing with the weather, cycling with kids, and how to fix a flat tire. You can find these webinars and more at pointa.ca slash design the new normal. There are a lot of other cycling resources available to you in York Region. The York Region cycling map is available online and shows you where to find cycling infrastructure like bike lanes, multi-use paths, and off-road multi-use trails. If you're interested in getting into road cycling and want to ride with others, look for your local cycling club. There are nearly 30 cycling clubs across York Region. If you live near Markham, the Markham Cycles Bike Hub offers some great cycling programming, including mentorship, community bike rides, guided do-it-yourself repairs, and youth programming. And finally, if you're looking for cycling information in another language, check out the Toronto Cycling Handbook online. It's a little Toronto specific, but it covers topics like cycling safety, the rules of the road, riding in traffic, and checking over your bike in 13 different languages. And that's it for the webinar. Thank you for taking your time to learn about cycling with us. While this webinar is pre-recorded, I'm still very happy to answer any questions that you might have. Just type your answers in a comment below and I'll respond with an answer.